All right. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, you enjoy the opening couple of talks, yeah? Good? All right, cool. Uh, well, today we have an exciting track of content lined up. And kicking things off, we have Mike Avenson and Zdenek Nemec uh, talking about the mother of all APIs. So take it away. Thank you, sir. All right, hello. Good to see you. Good to see you here. Get myself set up here. I actually, this work? No? I know. No? I can try this. Oh, it's going to go downhill from here. This is this. Okay. Just press button. Okay, yep. You're holding it wrong. No? Okay, it's all Focus. lines. Focus. <laughs> Dancer. Okay, this space should be working. Okay, all right, very good. Okay, okay. So, um, actually, if you, I don't know if you can tell, but Z and I are a little wound up here. We've been working on this for, uh, for a little bit. Um, this is kind of an, an ex a really exciting talk for me, and I hope it'll be interesting for you as well. Uh, you can hear me okay, right? I just, I'm having a little challenge. Okay, very good. I, I, I wanna say for a minute, um, I'm really happy to be on stage here with uh, Z. I learned, first learned and, and met him when he was working on the apiary stuff and co-author of Emson. Uh, we've done a few things together in, uh, recently. Uh, good API, all the things you've been working on. You helped me uh, actually have an experience with uh, DHL as well. One of the things I'm really excited about that we're talking about today is a project that Z's been working on uh, for quite a bit and I've been helping him out. So I'm really happy to be here. So we'll get that, that taken care of. Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, so am I happy to be here with Mike. He is, of course, world-renowned uh, speaker and author, helping many companies with, uh, with their API journeys and, and, and uh, consulting on architecture and microservices. But most importantly, he is the pioneer in APIs. He is uh, a mentor, at least to me and many of us. He's uh, over the years helping us to uh, you know, understand the APIs. And I always say that uh, we as a group of experts are here and Mike is somewhere here. You know, we are trying to follow him up and, and catch up with whatever I'm, he's I, doing. I have to check, am I dead? <laughs> <laughs> no, is, it's true, Mike. Is, is that what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I'm gonna need to uh, uh, refer to my notes. I apologize for that. Uh, this is a brand new talk. This is something we just worked on, so I don't have ev everything down perfectly. But um, the, the real message of my talk is really based around this date, December 9th, 1968. December 9th, 1968 is when uh, there was a demo in San Francisco that has come to be called the mother of all demos. Who's heard of the mother of all demos before? Okay, very good. Well, hopefully this will still be interesting to you as well. But what I want to do is more than just talk about the mother of all demos and, and Douglas Engelbart, who ran that demo. I want to talk about the early days of programming computers, programming machines. This, by the way, is a machine that was built for NASA to help manage NASA uh, aircraft. Um, so that's, that's one example. However, I also want to talk about how the early days of programming and the things we're doing today are tied to this. This is the underground cave system in my state of Kentucky. Has anyone been to Mammoth Caves before? Anybody heard of Mammoth Caves before? All right. So it turns out there's an amazing connection between the caves underground in western Kentucky and early programming and this gentleman right here. And this gentleman is Douglas Engelbart. And this is Doug, actually, this is a shot from his Mother of All Demos, a 90-minute tour de force that was just an amazing demo in 1968. And we'll kind of use that as a jumping off spot and what I really want to talk about is what was happening in computer programming uh, in, the, in the early age, that's in the 50s, in that decade beyond, how Engelbart wanted to change the way we thought about computing, and how it turns out this idea of caving and caves affected the way we write programs today, the way we actually network programs today, and how that can help us figure out how to deal with APIs in the future. I really like Paul's talk. I like that Paul was talking about ecosystems and hopefully this will give us some other ideas on those ecosystems as well. So let's talk about that demo day in 1968. So what happened is, is there, was, there was a conference in town, this is 1968, think about what was going on in 1968, where you were. 
if you were. <laughs> Some of us were. Um, uh, and it was like today, it was breezy, it was cool, it was uh, overcast in San Francisco. And Douglas Engelbart uh, starts off on this demo to about 2,000 people in the room. And he starts showing off some amazing things in computing, things that at the time were just absolutely astounding. One of the biggest things is he's actually working on an interactive computer. In 1968, computers were not interactive. They had no screens. Um, if you were lucky, they took punch cards in and they created print paper out, and that was it. And many of them in the beginning didn't even do that. They looked like that NASA computer I showed you a minute ago, which was just rows and rows of lights. If you look at science fiction shows from the 60s and 70s, all their computers don't have screens either. They have lights, they have just rows and rows of lights, as if we could all understand how to flip switches and, and understand the color of the light, and that's how we would actually operate computers. That's what people thought back then. But what was amazing is not only what he showed, but how he showed it. This is actually the keyboard setup that Doug used while he was on stage. And you'll recognize in one hand the early version of what we now call the mouse, his pointing device. His mouse that he actually built, hand built himself out of block of wood and a couple of wheels and some rubber bands. And you can see he has four buttons on the top of it. But what I find even more amazing is what he has in his other hand. What he has in his other hand is this paddle wheel, or this, this set of paddles. There are four paddles. It turns out that Engelbart didn't actually type much on the keyboard. He typed all his lettering on that paddle on the left. He had worked out a system, and you'll, you'll see a, a version of that a little bit later. He worked out a system where all of the letters could be touched with the paddle. Punctuations and some other things and line edits were actually done at the keyboard. So what he was doing in 1968 is showing people an interactive computer system in a way that no one had ever really seen it before. And what he showed off were some amazing things. He showed off real-time multi-cursor in-place editing. He had people in his location and 30 miles away over by Stanford uh, University uh, operating at the same time. He showed point and click, drag and drop, cut and paste for the first time. He actually showed hyperlinking, hypermedia, clicking on something and then following it to the next step. Intelligent outline-based editing, automatic indentation and linking and so on and so forth. Text messaging between parties, live video and text editing on the same screen. And version control, revision control. Doing all of this in 1968 interactively blew people's minds. Today we expect that, 50 years from now, we expect that every day, but in 1968, that was just seen as totally incredible. What he was really trying to do is change the way we thought about what the future of computing would look like. He sat in this chair. It's a specially built chair, actually, from Herman Miller. If you know what Aeron chairs are, anybody know what Aeron chairs are? Well, he had one specially built just for this system so it could hold this keyboard. This was all at a time when computers looked like this when they were the size of trailers, big rooms that were in special air conditioning. And if you'll notice in this, in this picture, there's just dozens and dozens of wires. Actually, computers were hardwired back then. You actually uh, programmed them by connecting one wire to another. So he's actually completely changing the way we think about what computing ought to be. This is the um, UNIVAC. This is, the, at the time, in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, the top line uh, advanced computer. And again, you see lots and lots of lights and a handful of switches, but no screen. And by that, by the way, is just the control console. Uh, the, the rest of the machine looks like this. That control console is connected to all these other parts. And there are rows and rows of, of banks of what are called plug boards with wiring. This is actually a very advanced machine because it actually has tape in the back. To, to accept tape input was really quite incredible. So in 1968, people thought computers were just fancy calculators. They did ex really complicated problems like missile trajectories and things like that, but they were just calculators. They weren't really very far from what we originally had at that time. But Doug wanted a different world. He wanted a world where humans actually interacted with the machines, where teams of people worked together on a particular project in an interactive kind of way where lots and lots of people could mix things like audio and video and everything. This is actually one of the behind the scenes uh, looks at his demo. 
Uh, and these are people that were actually at a, at a distant location at a place called the Stanford Research Institute that Doug ran. And they were actually sending video feeds and doing other programming tasks at a distance all at the same time in real time. So the way Doug thought about computing was like this. Computers should help us come up with better solutions and faster solutions. And that meant that we could tackle more complex problems. And that would mean that we were advancing human capabilities. We were augmenting our intellect. And when we advanced human capabilities, we could then build other computers that would make us build better solutions and faster solutions and deal with more complex problems over and over and over again. What he called this was bootstrapping. That step by step, we could use technology to make us smarter, make us better, and make our communities and our, and our uh, world better. And isn't that a lot of what we think about when we think about APIs? APIs are supposed to come up with better solutions, faster solutions, so that we can focus on other problems. So here we are 50 years later, we're kind of doing the same thing that Engelbart was talking about, trying to figure out how to make things faster and better. And what I'd like to do at this point is turn it over to my colleague Z, and you're gonna show us what it's like to build APIs today, right? What we're doing. Of course. Right? Okay. Thank you, Mike. Very good. So this will be some uh, live uh, demo. Hopefully it will work with us. I'm trying to be here, uh, uh, the team of people you've seen on the screen with uh, more modern technology. So let's see how this works. Uh, so what you have here on the screen, this is uh, a map of uh, uh, islands of uh, Koana. And uh, Koana Islands are a beautiful country. The problem only is the weather can be there uh, quite harsh. You can have uh, earthquakes in one place and uh, thunderstorms in another, just you know, uh, within a few few uh, hundred kilometers away. So when you are traveling on the Kona Islands, uh, you need to better know, you know, about the weather alerts. Luckily, there is a service that provides uh, weather alerts information for the Kona Islands. Right? This is the API documentation of uh, a weather service and. Uh, here you can see that you can simply query the uh, get alerts endpoint and uh, with the address locality, and you might get the information of uh, what's going on uh, wherever you are on the on the Kona Islands, whether there are some important and uh, uh, critical alerts, right? So if you'll be if you'll be uh, traveling on the Kona Islands, you might be uh, interested in uh, connecting to this uh, to this uh, weather service, right? And now the technology is helping me to do the demo. The point is, if you would be uh, uh, in a position to create a dashboard for, uh, for you know, these weather alerts, you would be uh, probably doing some imperative programming like, uh, like you see here on the screen. So using a JavaScript, uh, you would make a, a hard-coded uh, URL in the code, you will, uh, you will put there a, a get request method, you will put there uh, some some headers and you will also hard code the response from whatever you are getting uh, from the weather API or weather alerts API into into uh, your internal representation of those data. Right? This is this is how we are doing it today. It all should work just fine. You know, it's a, it's a hard coded and uh, when I make the request, I'll get the weather alerts. For example, here for Lexington, I might see that there are some thunderstorms going on. Right? Now. What happens today if a provider decides to change this API, right? So uh, if you'll be with, with me, I'm going to change the provider, the service that provides the information about this API. So uh, for this, I'm going to change uh, the version, uh, for example, to version 4, redeploy the provider. The version 4 of this API is I did a, a small little change before the request, uh, the required parameter here was called address locality, right? Now, if I refresh the documentation, it's no longer address locality; it's called place. What happens now if I make the call with a, with a, such a hard-coded client, right? If I try to uh, query the weather again, I will get uh, 400 missing required parameter because I hard-coded address locality, but now the service provider changed the, the parameter into a place and my client is broken. I have no idea what's, what about the weather in uh, where I'm about to go in the Koana Islands. And with that, back to Mike. Okay, all right. And back to slides. And back to slides. So right, you could, even, you could even hear in the description, what we say is we say hard-coded, right? Just like hardwired. 
right? We're actually, the way we build APIs today is very much the way we program computers in that first decade. And we know that that, that needs to change. So um, what we really saw is that there are humans inside of all of this, right? They're actually, you have to constantly keep feeding this. You have to keep watching and monitoring and see if somebody changes something. And everybody's affected. Even when there's a small change, everyone is affected. And this really kills our effectiveness when we need to build large-scale systems. As we build smaller and smaller uh, units and we try to assemble them together, it becomes more and more brittle and more and more frightening. So this idea of having to nurse everything and make sure it still works comes from the very beginning of computing. By the way, these are some of the earliest computers, part of a group called the ENIAC-6, the people who actually built and operated the very first computers that helped uh, compute trajectories for World War II. Uh, uh, the person sitting on the, on the bottom here, uh, uh, sitting down at the, at the keyboard, is a woman by the name of McNulty. Uh, Mary Kay McNulty, she actually designed many of the very first computer systems that we work on today and helped as part of this team to build uh, the programs that we have today. And one of the people who was effective in that uh, team of six, the ENIAC six, was this person, Grace Hopper. Has anybody heard of Grace Hopper before? Grace Hopper, Admiral Hopper, she was a Navy Admiral. Grace was a fantastic mathematician and she understood what was going on with computers sooner than most. And she understood that the way they were doing it today, that they were wiring in step by step, was non-scalable, was not going to work. She understood the same thing that we understand today about the way APIs break. You can't hard code everything, it's gonna be a problem. So she and her team, these are some more of the ENIAC 6, um, they made them pose in sort of goofy ways to, to, for publicity shots. But this is actually the ENIAC computer that was, uh, that was built in Pennsylvania that eventually uh, uh, helped uh, win the war. This team of people went to another company called a, the Mochley, uh, Eckert Mochley Computer Company and they built a thing called the UNIVAC. And the UNIVAC is what we were looking at earlier. Here is, uh, here is Hopper teaching other operators how to use the UNIVAC. And again, it's a, it's a nicely posed shot. But the UNIVAC was one of the very first commercially successful computers, but you still needed to wire it in. This is a plug board. This is actually what programming used to look like. You'd have these boards that you'd slide in in several places. I think this is the one from the IBM 1401, where you would wire up these, these, these set these wires and then slip this in and now that's the program. And then if you wanted to run another program, you'd pull out these, these plug boards, you'd rearrange the wires and you'd stick them back in. And of course, you'd hope you did it right. Right, because then you'd have to you'd have to debug them if not. And the original computers were run by vacuum tubes. Uh, the uh, the first Univac had 18,000 vacuum tubes. You can imagine if one of those goes out, the whole system doesn't work anymore. So you got to figure that out as well. So what Hopper needed, what she knew she needed, was something different. What she needed was what she called automated programming. She needed a system that would automatically write the program for her. Now, everyone that uh, built these computers told her she was crazy. That was not possible. That's like asking uh, cheese to, to curdle itself or something. They had some weird stories they told her. And she said, no, 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 this is exactly what we need to do. So what she did is she started building the very first compilers. And what she wanted was, uh, Flowmatic was the compiler that was like at the third or fourth generation one that she built, but she wanted one that would actually work for any computer, whether it was built by the Motchley company or by IBM or by Sperry or by uh, Remington or any of these other companies. She wanted a universal programming language. So this was 1958, I think, or 1960. So she and another team got together and they built the very first universal programming language. Does anybody know what that language would have been? Yes? COBOL, all right? COBOL, the language that they thought would just get them through the next couple of years, but it actually is still active today. And COBOL is really the universal language of computing, and it brought the notion of high-level abstraction to the idea of, of programming. So now it doesn't matter where the wires are plugged in, it doesn't matter how many peripheries there, peripherals there are, it doesn't matter who built the, uh, the machine, then it, we can now use the same language over and over again and it will still work. But there was still a big challenge. So even when we now have COBOL language, we still have lots of challenges and those, those challenges are related. This is the 1401, by the way, that I was talking about earlier. The challenges are related to what happens when we move a computer, what happens when we add peripherals, what happens when we change different parts of it. So automated programming was our first step, this notion of compiling. And in a lot of ways, automated programming is a lot like autonomous APIs. 
How can I start getting things to work together? How can I talk in a universal form that isn't implementation specific, that would let people to actually use APIs over and over again, even when small parts change? And I think you may have an example of something like that. Absolutely. You Thank you, Mike. So autonomous APIs is a topic that uh, I've been pondering about for the uh, last uh, four or six years. Mike, probably even longer than you know, uh, uh, all of us. And uh, I'm going to show you this on the example of, of, of this Kona Islands weather, weather, weather alerts. Now, this was our hard-coded client. Of course, if you would like to fetch, uh, if you would like to fix the implementation, you would have to go to your client, change the address locality to the place, and redeploy it to all the devices. Right? This is possible if you control the client. It's not so much possible when you have no control and people have those clients on their, on their iPhones, and you cannot you cannot redeploy the clients there. You can try, but it's it's very difficult. So we were thinking that there has to be a better way. I'm just going to uh, revert the version back to v1 of our API. And uh, uh, I have come up with a, with a solution that I'm going to show you right now. Um, there is a, a simpler way to make a call using this, uh, this declarative code. So this is my, my uh, client code that doesn't have any HTTP details, any details about uh, a particular provider. So. Here is my here is my original version, just to show you that, that it works as V1 with the address locality as a as a parameter. And if I'm going to change to it and uh, I uh, refresh or make the call again, I'm going to uh, uh, get a response with the information about the thunderstorms. Now let's let's walk through some possible changes, not not all of them, of course. I'm going to change this API to another version, V2. This time, uh, a V2 has uh, uh, a different URL, right? Before it was a slash alerts, now it's a weather dash alerts, right? I've pretty much broken all the hardcore, hardwired uh, clients. However, not not with this new client. When I make the request, you will still get a quite important information that there is uh, an earthquake going on at uh, Arbordale, right? So let's try to do some more changes. I'm going to uh, switch to v3, which is uh, using a, a post instead of get, right? Of course, another, another breaking change. Now you see the same API, it's a post alert. And uh, of course, when I, when I make the request, I will, I will still get a, a, get a successful response, right? I can also show you here in the, in the code of the, or in the console of the provider. So this is the server implementing, uh, implementing the weather service. You can see here that the request that it is indeed getting has uh, a little uh, post uh, method there instead of, of what was there originally. But there is no notion about these uh, technicalities in, in the client, right? The last example, I'm going to go uh, back to our version 4, so changing the address locality to the place, right? So going back to get. Place is in the place, and of course, if I if I'll make the request again, I'm going to uh, get a successful response with the information about the weather alerts in uh, in the location. All this without hardwiring stuff, without redeploying the clients that I might not even have a control of. Mike. Okay. So, so you can see now we're sort of at this next stage. We're sort of at this idea that we can start to have a more abstract view, another higher level view. We're taking humans out of the process. Humans don't have to actually monitor every step, every URL, every method change, every argument change. If we use a higher level abstraction or a higher level approach, this is very much what uh, Grace Hopper was doing with computing uh, uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. And Engelbart knew that. Engelbart understood that that last decade, that from the 50s to the 60s, had brought this new notion of leveling up on the abstraction. And he wanted to take it to the next step. He wanted to take it to the notion of making computers interactive for us so that we can actually solve problems. He knew that we could do things differently. And then he knew that because Grace Hopper had already changed the face of computing in the last 10 years. But there are still challenges ahead. This is the actual construction of the IBM 360. The construction of the IBM 360 is this long story, this tale. This was actually the first really super uh, scalable, uh, affordable uh, construction of a mainframe. It almost killed IBM building it the very first time. They had to learn so many things along the way. 
Uh, one of the things that happened to uh, Engelbart is that he was told at his event, you know, this is interesting, but I don't think it's very practical. And a lot of the things that he talked about 50 years ago took decades to implement. That interesting but not very practical sounds a little familiar. If you recognize this document, this is what Tim Berners-Lee was told when he first described the World Wide <coughs> Web. Someone had written in the top of it, vague but interesting. <laughs> These are the words that kill your entire life, right? Uh, vague but interesting, right? <laughs> Not really practical, right? But I'm kind of getting ahead. What I want to do is I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the ARPANET. So this is one of the earliest versions of the ARPANET. ARPANET was uh, actually in test mode during uh, the demo that Engelbart was, was doing. He actually was using an early part of it. And if you'll notice, actually, um, the, one of those dots is actually marked SRI. Remember I mentioned the Stanford Research Institute? So Engelbart's computer, his online system, was actually one of the very first uh, intermediate message processes, or IMPs, on the ARPANET in the beginning. So he was already using the ARPANET. So the ARPANET is this idea of timeshare of, of lots and lots of computers. The ARPANET was built by uh, a company run by these three men, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, BBN. And they originally started as an acoustics company. They actually did the acoustics for the United Nations building. But they had an employee, this person here, JCR Licklider, who changed their future. And Licklider saw the power of computing in the, in the early 60s. He said, we need to get involved in this. Uh, he actually helped test the first PDP-1 and lots of other things. And he did a lot of investments in Douglas Engelbart's work. And Licklider knew already that lots and lots of computers were going to be a challenge. He wrote a memo that actually changed the way we thought about uh, how we connect computers. Notice the uh, memorandum is for the members and affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. Because in the 60s, we were dead serious about outer space, let me tell you. We were landing a person on the moon, right? We knew we were gonna have to have lots of computers in lots and lots of places, lots of toggles, lots of switches, lots of lights. So we were gonna have to figure this out. And one of the lines that he had in this was really, really interesting. He was talking about what's it gonna to take to connect lots of computers. And he's got this line. The problem is essentially one discussed by science fiction writers. How do you get communications started among totally uncorrelated sapient beings? What's he really saying here? When you meet an alien, how do you talk to her? How do you figure this out? How do you start a conversation? And he, he likened computers on a network to this very same idea. We were gonna have to figure out a way to start to talk to each other in a very abstract form to understand what each other are doing. He understood how important this was gonna be. So while people were still building the UNIVAC and still operating these computers, he was thinking ahead about how they were all gonna connect to each other. And that leads to this part of the story, my state of Kentucky. I had to work this in. <laughs> At the same time that Engelbart is doing his demo in the years 68 and 69 and, and around that, there were people in this, uh, exploring the, the mammoth caves in Kentucky. And one of the people that was doing a lot of exploring of the mammoth caves was Will Cowther. Will is the, is the person down here with the glasses sitting down. Has anybody ever heard of Will Cowther or Don Woods? Will Cowther and his wife, Patricia, did a lot of cave exploration. This, by the way, is a shot of the programmers at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. BBN, the people who built ARPANET. He was one of the programmers of the ARPANET. And it was his wife, Patricia, who had actually accomplished a, a, a very important feat. She actually proved the connection between the Flint Ridge Cave System and the Mammoth Cave System in Kentucky, making the Mammoth Cave System the largest known cave system in the world. She and Will mapped many, many, many miles of this system. And it was really sort of near and dear to their hearts. Now, it was because of uh, Patricia's success in finally finding this sort of link between these two systems, and uh, for other reasons, that Will started working on a project. Started working on a project on his computer uh, uh, in Fortran. And this project was actually a game. And it was a game to travel into all these rooms of the cave. It was based on all the cave experience they had had. And what he had built in 1972 was a game called the Colossal Cave Adventure, sometimes just referred to as Adventure or Advent, which was the command that you could use to start playing the game. Will Cowder invented online gaming <laughs> in 1972 with this text-based game. 
And gaming and adventure gaming has actually established the way we play games on the computer today. One of the important elements of it is that we can talk in simple English. We're programming the computer to go from place to place and do things in simple words and phrases. This is a picture of Will today. He's a little older, he's a little wiser, and he's probably a little bit more mellow than he used to be. He doesn't cave as much as he used to, but he is considered the father of the way, what we think of as computer gaming. And remember, it started from this very place. It started from this SRI-based uh, node in the BBN system. So lots and lots of people now really think about gaming. Gaming is a sort of a, a key element. And this adventure gaming in particular is sort of a, a metaphor for a lot of things. In fact, one of the very first hypermedia formats and clients that I built was actually one based on a maze, based on maze gaming, for the very same reason, that it's very much like the way we expect APIs to work. We want our APIs to actually go out and, and do something at this shopping cart and then do something with this credit card service and then do something with this shipping service and put it all together. But the problem is it's dangerous out there and you can end up in the wrong room and not have the right tool and you can't make it. Now humans are in the loop today in adventure gaming, but what would it be like if we could create adventuring APIs? Can we create APIs that can actually solve problems, fix themselves, do things, look and find and recognize things along the way. And that's the challenge I put to you next. Of course. All right. No small challenge, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to our story, we are on this uh, beautiful island. We have a, a client that is quite resilient. But what if uh, the service goes down, right? I have a, one little uh, a trick and point. Just don't tell anybody. If I, if I invoke this, you have to believe me, but the service is no longer available. <laughs> uh, again, don't, don't build this at home. Now, if I would uh, try to uh, do this uh, with a hard-coded client, of course, if I uh, would switch to hard-coded here, it would time out. That would take some 20 or so, 30 seconds, right? So I'm not going to do it. However, uh, I'm, st I'm still on, on my uh, uh, a new way of, of connecting to APIs. And when I make the call, guess what? I'm, I'm, I'm still getting a response. Like, OK, now this is a magic trick. I'm, I'm here with this black box. Uh, the truth is, if you, if you look closely, there is a, indeed another provider. Uh, the other one has a, has a different URL. If I uh, look at uh, its documentation, so there is more services providing weather alerts at the Kona Islands, right? So hopefully this, this will load. In a, in a few moments, and you will see that this is a, a, a very different service, yet within the same domain, providing a similar or almost the same information uh, for, for our API. Okay, here it goes, or not. I have it prefetched here. So the API description or API surface of that service is very different. It's post, it's a different URL than the other one, right? This probably will not surprise you anymore. It's not even taking a query parameter. It's taking uh, uh, some request body with a city uh, parameter, and it returns uh, a response that is a, a very different, uh, with a different field names than uh, uh, the one uh, previously. Yet, uh, my uh, smart client uh, was able to pick the service up, and uh, utilize it without hard coding to that particular service. Now, let's say there was just a little hiccup in that uh, in that main Koana Island service. So let me take uh, let me take this time this this one down, right? Actually, let me first uh, uh, boot up the, the the original service. Since I'm using Glitch, it should be uh, pretty fast. So now it's back up, and I'm going to uh, uh, shut down this uh, backup service that was there. And if I uh, make a call again, so this was the winter dash beach nut at Glitch, right? And now I'm going to make a call again with the same client. An important thing is I have ever, I did during this presentation, I did not redeploy the client. The client is still as it was. It was never deployed. The code was never changed. And as you can see, I'm already getting the information about uh, earthquakes at Arbordale. And uh, this time, I'm back to this uh, ballistic sombrero uh, service, which is the, the original provider. So here, my, my client was able uh, to overcome some hiccups of the provider using some other providers within the same domain, but maybe quite different API that was available. 
It's mine. Very good. So this was the third demo, and that was the answer to the question, what if the provider goes down? Now, we call this super interface uh, simply superface. This is a, a technology that I have uh, created based on uh, many amazing things that also Mike built and others. Uh, many of you are in this in this room. It's called superface. The objectives of this were, of course, to create a first implementation of autonomous APIs, but. Most importantly, I wanted to create it in a way that is easier to get started with, so you don't have to throw everything you have built already and start building the APIs differently. So it's very simple to get started with for both providers and consumers, even, even more simple for the consumers, right? The point there was to uh, get rid of, uh, uh, of uh, problems with outdated documentation and as humans eyeballing somebody's documentation, adapting the clients and redeploying the clients, right? And when you think about it, this helps you to get away of uh, any vendor lock-ins. So if you have a multiple you know, API providers within the same domain, you might use this to just be able to freely move between a different, different providers. And you can focus only on a, on a basically business objective of your clients. This is also a moving away a little bit from these discussions, oh, should I use REST or should I use GraphQL or gRPC or whatnot? Because this is an abstraction layer on top of these architectural styles and you know the client can work with uh, many different uh, types of API. Now, Superface is coming uh, in 2020. We take a little, little break uh, over the Christmas, of course, as an open source project. So we totally want everybody to use this. We think that we as a main kind have to move away from writing the documentation and reading the documentation to, to you know, uh, uh, higher goals and focusing on, on the business logic. We might have some commercial support for Superface coming later in 2020. So if you are interested in this, we, we need to hear, hear this from you, that this makes sense, that you are interested in this technology. If you want to maybe employ an autonomous API for your next project, or if you just want to work on this, uh, then please let us know. Check out the superface.ai. You might find more information about autonomous APIs. Uh, ping us here at, uh, at the conference or send us an email at hello at uh, Superface AI. We'll be happy to uh, discuss uh, the autonomous APIs and the Superface. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We have about 10 minutes uh, for Q&A, so does anybody have any questions for anybody up here? Anybody? And I'm going to actually give the mic back to y'all. Um, okay. Yes. Right, so the question was, uh, you noticed that there was a, something referred to a registry in the demos, and you're asking about w where do clients or providers fit into this notion of registries, right? Do I have that? So, um, yeah, the, the, the implementation as it is now is that the registry is where you go to find, right? So you notice that the service actually n saw that there was something that was down. It went back to the registry to see if it could find another service that matches the same uh, description. Is there another weather service or Kona Islands? So um, both clients and providers will be aware of a registry. What will happen is when providers uh, boot up, they'll go register at one or more places. It's sort of like your, your television channel or your news store or your distribution, whatever. And when anybody else goes shopping, when clients are looking to put something together, when they fire up, they can actually use, use descriptive information or profile information to find all of the services that are going to solve their problems. And they might actually find more than one and use them as, as backups. Is that, is that about right? That's uh, very correct, Mike. Does that help? Cool. Other questions? Anyone? Yes. Absolutely. So the bro the browser demo was there uh, for for you know taking the uh, uh, 
using the benefits of the, this platform. But uh, yes, the client currently is written in uh, JavaScript and Node.js, so it can run in uh, Node.js and uh, or browser. And we plan to uh, create more uh, clients and sort of, so to speak, bindings to uh, different languages, starting with the Python. But absolutely, yeah, it's not it's not the browser thing. It's the first implementation is written in JavaScript, though. There's another question. Was it yes? No, it's your it's okay. your work. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, how do how do you know that the uh, uh, client actually understands or has some understanding of what the provider is doing? Right? Is it based on RDF or something else like that? Right? So it ac actually is similar. What we're using right now is a profile language, and the one that we're using is Alps that I and Leonard Richardson had worked on a few years ago. So there is a way to create a kind of um, a, a zone, like we're going to talk about weather here. And there, so there are weather concepts, like asking about an advisory and so on and so forth. It's very similar in a way to what Paul Fremantle was talking about, this notion of having a, a boundary or a fence or a, a, some kind of limitation. So that actually turns out to be the shared understanding between mm -hmm. parties. Is this one what we're calling a profile bit of information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a, it's, a, it's a domain only, right? So it's not specific to a particular provider. There are no details about the technical implementation where the service runs or whatnot. This is, this is not the, the, let's say, open API specification. This is uh, just the semantics of, uh, uh, I, I think of a profile as a use case within a particular domain, open a bank account, fetch, fetch alerts and whatnot. We have time enough for another one? one? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> so, so I'll just give the short version. Uh -huh. This is Licklider's question, right? Licklider's question is how do we get sapient beings, uncoordinated sapient beings to talk to each other? Licklider's decision was that we were going to create a high level descriptive language, but not a low level implementation language. So that's what we're going to do. The way that Alps was originally designed by uh, Leonard and I, you could have lots and lots of variations of what a weather service is. And what I would do is when I connect it, I would say, look, I need version seven of weather as you know, per something, something, something. Who out there actually provides that? And an individual service might actually talk more than one semantic version of weather. So this is still wide open, and this allows the community to kind of decide what it is. We don't right. have to coordinate right. that language. Absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, there is one more question, but uh, just to add. Uh, this makes sense even if you are basically talking to yourself, just if you want to have this uh, you know, uh, resilience and be able to uh, evolve your API. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have profile only for your service, it might seem as an overhead, but you might do it. Uh, but yes, as Mike said, uh, in, a, in a bigger scenarios, there might be different profiles for the same things. There might be also a mapping between the profiles, right. but that's... That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The, so ask again, investigate the what? The abstract surface, because it's not something that uh, I have uh, components that make decisions for me between, uh, I, I'm more intermediary. I don't have just this network intermediary to abstract DNS or uh, HTTP intermediary, but I have semantic intermediary. So the actual process and communication between me and you may be semantically modified by the intermediary. Ah, okay. So I, if I understand the, the, the question is, uh, have we thought about the notion that there might actually be semantic intermediaries, not just uh, routing or protocol intermediaries? Is that the question? And this exposes the communication to different kind of attacks. Right. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Um, we, we haven't addressed that directly, but we could use any of the existing encryption or uh, certificate services. So 
This is actually true in sort of the Shannon sense. This is actually just bits on the wire. Each individual party does not have to understand the inside of the message. So it could be totally encrypted. It can even be customized to run over VPNs or something else like that to protect it. We also, in this version, didn't address security in general, but in the, in the discovery specification, Open Disco it's called, there is a plug-in for any, any type of security that you'd like to do. So there are definitely possibilities. And we need some more work in that security space as well, security and privacy as well. Time for one, maybe two more questions. Okay, one, maybe two, maybe one more. Anybody have any more? Yes. So, so right now it's a, it's it's not like one service, of course. It's a couple of couple of things. There are a couple of uh, uh, formats that are making this possible. So that's one thing. One of them, one of these formats is uh, this Alps profile. So semantic description of the use case. Then uh, there is this. Uh, uh, Client that is a higher level client that's uh, that you are using uh, to basically declaratively say what you want from that domain. This is called SuperDriver. Uh, really it's, a it's a library. It's right? a library. It's a I'm really bad with the names, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, that's uh, available uh, on npm right now. Again, the uh, JavaScript uh, ecosystem, and there is a, a Disco. Okay. It's just, uh, there's a registry, there's right? a and actually the, the Disco registry is available. This version is on a slightly, they've kind of drifted a little because they're both early, but there's, you can find a, a container, containerized version of an open Disco registry. So you can actually run a registry today by just running a container. So, 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 there, so there is a lot of pieces, actually. The goal of the Superface is to put it all together and, and prepare some, like, you know, uh, a, a nice, nice way to uh, onboard you into. But you as a provider, you don't need to do much. And you as a consumer, you just throw out all the HTTP imperative code and use the SuperDriver library. It's just as, uh, so the question is, does it become a single point of failure? It does in the same way that DNS does. Right, the communication is not happening through any of Superface intermediary. The, yeah. the communication is always from your consumer, unlike any harmonization that we are seeing today with APIs. This is uh, direct from consumer uh, to the provider. This is not going through uh, some Superface servers. Yeah, there's, n there's no hub, there's no gateway or anything like that in it. I think we're out of, are we out of time? We're out of time. All right, big round of applause for Mike and Z. Thank you.